Okay. So, uh, it's perfect. So, welcome everyone and uh, good evening. Thank you for waiting uh, for this uh, presentation to start and we're sorry to be late. Uh, so, uh, Jan and I uh, tonight will do the, the presentation, the moderation, sorry. And uh, we have with us uh, Ioana Florea uh, from Bucharest, who is going to present us uh, the study she made with Agnes uh, and Kirsten. I, I will not pronounce the names because I'm worried I will not do it well. Uh, but um, Agnes will join us uh, in a few moments. Uh, she had some technical issues and she will come uh, uh, to join us uh, soon. So this uh, event is organized tonight by the European Action Coalition for the Right to Housing and to the City. Uh, the, the European Action Coalition, I will say it in short like this, uh, it's a network of uh, grassroots uh, collectives uh, and some organizations who are fighting for the right to housing and to the city. Uh, we are uh, now 34 members from more than 20 countries uh, of Europe, of uh, the general uh, Europe, uh, 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 not the European Union, but Europe in general. Uh, and uh, we try to, through this network, uh, to create uh, bridges between the movements, uh, to exchange skills, uh, but also uh, to do some uh, work together uh, in the research field or also uh, in the action field. And we organize, uh, for example, the Housing Action Day, uh, which uh, takes place at the end of March uh, each year. Uh, and it's an event uh, in uh, the European, uh, uh, in, in many European uh, countries. Um, so, um, yes, we had a small uh, appearance of uh, a laptop uh, page, sorry. Uh, so this is the European Action Coalition, huh? we can say in a few words. I, yeah. I didn't forget anything. Um, and tonight we, we are very, very happy because uh, for the first time, I think, we are doing a public event on Zoom about uh, Bucharest and Budapest situation. And uh, this is because uh, we have the wonderful study uh, uh, that was made by uh, uh, these three authors I presented, uh, Agnes, Ioana, and Kirsten, uh, that, that uh, we think that for our move, the movements who are part of the European Action Coalition is a very important study and it can learn us many things. So we wanted to hear more about it and have a, a discussion around, the, uh, around it. Uh, so maybe Ioana, I will let you present yourself now and also after if you can say a few words uh, about the study itself. Hi everyone, good to see you all. Uh, thank you for joining. And um, uh, to say that uh, uh, Agnes Gagi and uh, Kerstin and uh, me, we worked uh, on this study um, as part of a bigger project that looks at uh, social movements in Eastern Europe. Um, it was part of a research project at the University of Gothenburg. Um, it, we also uh, won a grant from the FORMAS uh, Research Council, so it was really good to have this as a background and work together. We really worked together. Uh, I am uh, part of the um, Common Front for Housing Rights in Bucharest, and uh, I am also uh, part of the research group at the European Action Coalition for the Right to Housing and the City. It's really good to see all the colleagues and comrades from there, from all over uh, the place. And um, uh, Agnes is also connected to the movements in Budapest. So we, we uh, on, worked on this together, but we also worked on this 
with many colleagues and comrades from the ground to which we are very thankful. So both in Budapest and in Bucharest and uh, in Cluj and in Timisoara and even outside of these cities, in, we, we worked with a lot of colleagues and we are very thankful to them. Um, and uh, uh, besides this, this study that is free to download and you get the link in the Facebook event to download it, uh, there were also many other things that came out of the research. So different um, articles in left on the leftist platform, um, in the Radical Housing Journal, in, on Interface, so on different uh, other uh, platforms, let's say. So this is a bit about the background of the study and about us. And uh, what we were thinking about this study was to, um, to, say, to say things that are relevant beyond our region. So some to, to uh, tell you some of the things that we find useful for other contexts as well, not just Eastern Europe. So this is one of our goals. Um, the other uh, is to um, tell you a bit more in detail about our context, because there are things to be learned from uh, the case of Budapest and Bucharest. Um, most of all, because there is a bias in research as well as in activists many times that looks uh, only at uh, progressive movements or uh, movements with which the researchers are sympathetic or uh, they have things in common. And we wanted to uh, look beyond that. So we didn't only look at the housing uh, justice movements, but we looked at the context, at the wider context and the other movements that I, they are connected to on the ground. Um, and some of them are uh, not progressive movements. And we will get into that a bit, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> And then we also um, wanted to tell you that um, uh, our cities on, on a first level seem different, the situations seem different from the rest of Western world, let's say. But in fact, there are many similarities such, such as uh, rising housing costs, um, a, a big lack of housing for those who have uh, lower incomes, um, uh, also uh, rising costs of living in general while um, um, incomes and wa wages are not growing. Uh, then of course, this process of financialization of housing that is going on everywhere, but in different ways. And that means putting housing um, in a, in a risky situation in which fluctuations on the financial market directly affect housing. So housing is directly linked, becomes directly linked into these financial uh, uh, flows, global flows. And this is similar uh, to all our contexts, but of course with differences because it happens differently everywhere. Uh, and then also to tell you that uh, we are all integrated in to capital flows, global capital flows, into uh, what uh, the EU um, requirements and laws uh, mean, but we are integrated in different ways. So everything that happens in Budapest, Bucharest is connected to what happens in other contexts, although it's different. It's different, but connected. So this is something that we remind ourselves also as researchers and also as activists. And this, is also, this can also be a ground for uh, making bridges uh, transnationally. Um, so um, this is, let's say the macro picture and uh, should I go a bit into uh, telling you some of the findings already? Yeah? Yes, okay. Yes. okay. Uh, and we leave some of them also for uh, Agnes when she, when she enters. So I will tell you what I find uh, the most interesting and she will tell you what she finds the most interesting. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. One point is 
uh, and I think this is something that research can help movements with. Uh, one thing is that uh, we look at um, uh, housing deprivation, uh, different forms of housing deprivation and lack of access to adequate housing. And we see there is a very wide population affected by this problem. At the same time, we see that there is only a small proportion of people or of groups that actually mobilize to fight. So it's not that problems immediately lead to mobilization. It sounds simple, but it's important to remind ourselves uh, about this. So it's not that people are not affected, but uh, in order for mobilization to happen, you need different factors to come together, to combine in order to make this possible. And one of the findings that is from our own context, it might be not the same in other contexts, and Agi can tell you um, uh, more about this, is that um, in our uh, cases, the middle class is the educated, uh, but not very um, wealthy middle classes played an important role for articulating uh, problems into struggles and into claims. So this is one finding. Then there is something that I, I think it's very interesting that um, problems that we fight against today or that uh, our, our movements fight against today, they didn't start today. Uh, they didn't start even yesterday. <laughs> they didn't start with the 2008 crisis, but they started a long, long time ago. It is a long history and we traced it back uh, to the 19th century, for example, but it can go even uh, further back in the past. And we see an ongoing um, housing crisis since then, an ongoing polarization between the capital cities and the main cities and the rest of the country and the rural areas, uh, especially. And this uh, continuous, um, uh, uneven development between regions and cities and cities and rural areas that uh, uh, generate cycles of crisis of housing, of uh, lack of income for housing, uh, of um, policies that cover, try to cover some of the problems, but leave other problems uncovered. So you see these cycles going on. Uh, throughout uh, decades and decades. And at the same time, you see that the, um, uh, that the um, uh, certain parts of the middle classes are pushing to gain more access to how the city is developing, decisions about housing, decisions about um, income and uh, uh, actually, yeah, trying to, to to gain more power into decision making. So it is a long history that creates the conditions uh, of today. And uh, whatever new crisis comes, uh, it comes on, on top of this. So it, it, why is it important to look at this long history? Um, for example, uh, struggles in Bucharest, the most important struggles for housing in Bucharest today are linked to uh, opposing evictions from homes that were nationalized in the 40s and 50s, but then reprivatized through restitutions when the regime changed in uh, 89. And then you ask our, yourself, so what happened? Why were these homes nationalized? And you look and you see that before 45, uh, a huge part of the population lacked access to property and housing. They, they lived in whatever shacks they could find, whereas a small proportion of the population uh, had uh, housing and blocks and villas and things like that. So there was a huge uh, imbalance, a huge, um, you could say, injustice. And then nationalization tried somehow to uh, balance this, of course, with many imperfections and its own difficulties and um, that are even more visible in the um, case of Hungary than in the Romanian case, but still here as well. 
So in order to understand why people fight against evictions today in Bucharest, you have to, if you want to understand it, you have to look at this longer history. At the same time, there is a movement uh, that protects a heritage in Bucharest. And this is a right liberal uh, movement, if you look at the political spectrum, and it is linked to the same homes. They try to protect the heritage of these buildings for their cultural value and historical value uh, without care for the people living in them. So these two movements, they are at the opposing ends of the political spectrum. Sometimes they try to ally against a big developer, but many times they, they, uh, they cannot find an alliance, but they are linked to the same wider process. So this, this is an example. Um, then uh, why is it that in the Romanian case, you don't have so many uh, debtors in, uh, that lost their homes to the banks? And it is because Romania entered this banking um, wave later on, uh, even later on than Hungary, but even both of them even later than the West, they entered at the time when capital was no longer patient at all. <laughs> so the capital tried to uh, make gains fast. Uh, and in Romania, it made gains through targeting the middle classes that then had some, um, they, they weren't as large and they had um, the power to balance their situation and didn't lost their homes in such a great number. Whereas in Hungary, it went through the uh, lower middle class and uh, the uh, working class, classes, parts of it, that, um, so this wave came in Hungary before, uh, targeted these groups that with the, with the 2008 crisis didn't have the resources to continue paying their, um, uh, interest rates. So um, it is, you know, you, you see these differences uh, that happen as capital enters different territories, like a, like a wave, but it's the same wave that comes from the same big banks, the, the same big uh, investment funds and um, uh, capital um, uh, finan financial markets. Um, and yes, and another interesting thing, um, why don't we have a huge uh, tenants movement in, in Romania? And it's usually being said that because Romania uh, has a high percentage of owner occupied homes, what, and in the media, it's usually presented, oh, you have many owners in Romania, but that's not really how the story goes owner-occupied homes doesn't mean you have uh, an entire population of owners, but it means that households and one person in a household of 10, for example, owns a flat for the family, for the household. But it's true, households do have this, uh, many households do have a property. It can be a very small one, it can be at the edge of the city, it can be rural, of, okay, it exists, that's, okay, that's better than nothing, but it doesn't mean safety for, the, for everyone in the household. And when people try to make their own living, they become tenants, but it, they are not organized in tenant struggles, but they organize uh, for um, uh, wages to cover for the costs of rent. And yeah, the, there are explanations why they don't go as tenant movements, but as labor movements. So yeah, these are some of the some of the lessons that maybe are. Oh, and Agi is here! Yay! Yes, so. hello. Hello, sorry. Uh, welcome. Uh, we are happy to see you. Thanks. Just uh, on, I will catch up. We are sorry because we started before you come, but uh, um, yes, uh, but Ioannet presented some of uh, 
uh, of the work you have done together. Uh, and I think from a, a more uh, Bucharest perspective, um, so, so as soon as she finishes, uh, you can also uh, uh, tell us your perspective. Ioana, you want to conc maybe conclude or, or say some more things? Uh, just to say, so that Aggie knows, I, I said a few things that I, fi I find interesting from our um, research about uh, not having uh, tenant struggles in Bucharest, for example, about the difference in debtors' uh, struggles in Bucharest, Hungary and the West, um, about this long-term perspective. But I, I think it would be, I left the, um, the double policy and the um, institutional uh, interface for you. So, perfect. Okay, so shall I just say that then? Yes, yeah, so the other uh, very interesting thing that we found uh, was that all the politicizations of housing problems uh, for the last 30 years in both countries, uh, in terms of structural tensions, uh, they all of them were about two main areas. Uh, one of them was uh, extreme forms of housing poverty at the bottom of the housing hierarchy, like uh, evictions, homelessness, uh, struggles over uh, getting access to social housing, uh, this kind of thing. And the other main area where the tensions were politicized was uh, the limited housing access for low and middle income groups uh, who, you know, because it's a super home ownership housing system uh, after privatization, in order to get a house for a new household, uh, either you inherit or uh, have super good income or you have to take a mortgage in order to get a house, uh, which might lead to indebtedness, or you have to rent. Uh, and then you have the problems of insecurity, low regulation, not enough rental apartments, uh, and the soaring uh, rental prices as uh, time goes on. Uh, so it's these two main areas, the housing poverty and the housing access for uh, low and middle income groups. Uh, and then interestingly, all the types of the struggles that we found uh, were about uh, one or the other, uh, sometimes with overlaps. So when you have uh, increasingly precarious low and middle income renters, uh, they might come together with uh, movements that are about homelessness or uh, uh, social housing. This is the case in Budapest increasingly. So you have this um, stronger alliance uh, between uh, somewhat precarious middle-class renters uh, and the long-term uh, uh, movement around homelessness and social housing. But this one is about uh, getting state redistribution in order to provide affordable uh, rental housing uh, through straight redistribution. So people don't really get a guarantee that they will collectively own that place uh, or anything. It's through the state policy, state redistribution that they can get it. And this is one type uh, of how the movements gravitate. And the other one is about those people who enter the home ownership track and then they have problems with that. So they get indebted, then you have the debtors movement, uh, they have problems with uh, very high utility prices or maintenance. Uh, in Hungary, we, we have this socialist structure of housing cooperatives, which is basically just the structure of ownership, but they are the biggest uh, institution uh, that, uh, that embodies this interest of uh, 
of maintaining apartments for lower middle income uh, people for whom it's really hard to maintain these, these huge uh, houses. It's really hard to renovate the structure of the house. So it's these two types of uh, tension areas and the types of the movements mostly correspond to either the home ownership problems or the housing access through rental or, or social housing uh, problem. And then we saw that this somehow doubling or these two different channels of the movements, uh, they correspond to what my colleagues, uh, Chaba Jelinek and Zsuzsa Poshway uh, called the duality of housing policies uh, in post-socialist housing systems, uh, which basically means that after this big state system of of housing provision uh, is canceled, uh, you have a more and more narrow uh, branch of uh, state redistribution that is more, more about social housing, you know, the, the bottom of the hierarchy. And then uh, you have the other <laughs> thicker and thicker branch that is about using state uh, involvement to aid uh, housing provision through the market. So the typical example would be giving uh, uh, state subsidies to mortgages, which means that there will be more mortgages, uh, more um, market provided uh, housing, uh, but the state is somehow uh, helping uh, that sector to grow. Uh, and our, one of our big understandings uh, from the research was that if you look at the whole scope of how housing is provided and how policy deals with it, uh, then we see that there is this duality of the housing policies. Uh, basically, one of them is enhancing the market-based housing and, of course, also the uh, the contradictions and inequalities uh, that come with it. And the other uh, smaller branch is about, you know, trying to solve something through the distribution at the bottom of the hierarchy. Uh, and when movements come to address the, the actual housing problems, somehow they plug into either one or the other branch. So either it's about the problems of getting home ownership through the market, or it's about uh, trying to get the state to, to give that very narrow branch of straight redistribution to your own group uh, or to your you know, small alliance structure. And you know, what is behind this that remains hidden uh, is that this is a false duality uh, because <laughs> this dualization of the housing problematic comes from the first step of housing commodification. Uh, and this is something that we quote from this uh, Norwegian uh, unionist and researcher, uh, Asbjorn uh, Wall, who also describes this in the case of, you know, the, uh, the how, how the social democratic system of the welfare state is taken apart in the Nordic model. Um, he explains that the main idea also in terms of housing was that the, the social democratic governance, which has its social power from the unions, uh, keeps uh, certain reproductive areas outside of the market. For instance, you keep, try to keep most of housing outside of the market. Uh, then with uh, more and more neoliberal reforms, it goes into the market just like healthcare or transport or anything else. Uh, and then the market uh, starts to produce the inequalities. And for that, you create the, the social redistributive uh, branch that interferes uh, at the bottom of the problems. But meanwhile, all the other policies are aiding the marketization, thereby they produce more and more problems at the bottom. And uh, so, so with this parallel, we really thought that 
what is important is that movements somehow need to go beyond addressing these existing policy uh, interfaces that are already there because they are there in this duality. You can either ask for more redistribution or you can ask for somehow solving the home ownership and, and uh, that question. Uh, and these groups, they remain separate in the movement practice uh, in, in most of our cases. Uh, and then the, yes, the idea was that we really need to create our own movement uh, infrastructures that are able to, to formulate the question, not as that of redistribution or that of protecting your home ownership, uh, but somehow to bridge the whole thing together as a question of commodification, as the social struggle against commodification and taking housing to us out of the market. And for this, just one last thing, uh, one of the other interesting findings of ours might be interesting, and, and this is the role of middle-class expert activists. So interestingly, we saw that in each and every case of housing mobilization that we uh, looked at, which are quite numerous throughout the 30 years in the two countries, um, there were mobilizations where it was the affected people who were driving it, at least in the beginning, like homeless people's uh, demonstrations, uh, people who occupy social housing, uh, things like that. But by the time it gets articulated as a political demand or addresses some political institution, uh, it never happens without this uh, intermediary translating work of expert middle-class activists. And it is these activists who, who basically help frame the problem, <laughs> the tension, or, or you know, those people's cause who, who come uh, and act uh, for their own uh, needs. They frame it um, in a way that it can address these political institutions that are already there. So they can frame it as a problem of redistribution. They can frame it as a problem of right to housing or citizenship or uh, whichever other uh, uh, consumer rights like the debtors sometimes try to do it. Uh, and then <laughs> it is always easier to translate it to something that is already there. So it's often expert middle-class activists like us, <laughs> we recognize who always keep the, the expression of the housing tensions connected to this existing uh, duality of housing policy. Okay. Yeah, you, you can speak, I think they hear you. Can you hear us? Okay, so we still have some technical uh, problems here. Uh, never mind. So um, we thought to organize uh, this debate quite open. So maybe we have a first uh, round of uh, questions for clarification. And we said like, you can either raise your hands or you can uh, put your name in the chat. Or maybe, uh, Jox, you want to add something? No. <laughs> Okay, so far there is- uh, a, uh, There is George, yes. George. Hi. Okay, great. Uh, I've been having some technical problems as well, so I didn't have a chance to listen to the, uh, the introduction. But I wanted to say that um, I checked out the, the book a while ago and something that, uh, um, I, I noticed this, uh, that Yox, you were talking about um, um, activities of Roma-based organizations uh, in in uh, in the struggle for housing rights, 
And I think this is quite an important topic. Would you like to say more about it? And maybe we can even uh, discuss it a little bit uh, with the Hungarian experience as well. Uh, yeah, maybe to say that uh, uh, the um, uh, Roma rights groups were the first to politicize this topic in the 90s because uh, housing immediately in the 90s in Romania was framed as a humanitarian issue with the children on the street and uh, uh, homelessness. Uh, and it was framed in this way as a humanitarian emergency that needed charity work. And Roma organizations uh, framed it uh, as a, a social rights topic and uh, um, injustice. So um, uh, this was quite important for the later development of the, of the housing rights groups. Uh, and uh, uh, George, he's part of uh, Social Housing Now in Cluj, for example. And uh, the struggle developed, uh, it has a long history, but it grew and it, uh, uh, it expanded in uh, 2010. With a race, with an eviction that had a racist um, uh, character as well, uh, expulsing uh, uh, per, uh, families of Roma ethnicity outside the city. So, um, in, and in the case of Bucharest as well, um, evictions from uh, restituted buildings, these buildings with heritage value. Um, it's often affecting uh, persons of Roma ethnicity uh, disproportionately, so uh, more than others. So um, there is uh, also a long-term history of uh, blocking um, access to housing and to property for the Roma in our uh, uh, region and in Romania, especially where uh, Roma have been uh, uh, used as slaves until mid 19th century. And even after uh, mid 19th century, they were not uh, uh, compensated with property. So there is a long-term uh, blocking of access to property and adequate housing that in the period 45, 89, was not uh, entirely solved or it was not um, uh, sustainable enough solved. And uh, so this inequality uh, still affects the Roma families. And maybe Georgia, you want to add more from, from the experience in Cluj? I'm, I just wanted to say that, uh, yeah, I think you mentioned uh, Romani Chris. Did I say that already? Um, yeah, so this kind of like uh, uh, 90s and early 2000s, uh, I think it's it's very important in a way to go a little bit back and, and see and uh, actually acknowledge, properly acknowledge the work done by, by Roma activists. Um, because there's a different type of uh, activism that uh, housing rights activism that emerged after the crisis, right? And the European Action Coalition, I think, is it's, uh, it's one of the results of that. So if it's, I think it's a, it's a it's a it's a good topic to you know like look look into it a little bit uh, more. Maybe you already tackled the, the the topic more in depth. Okay. Yeah, so that was my my take on it. So, but uh, again, congratulations for for your work. It's uh, really inspiring. Great, thank you, George. Uh, Agnes, you want to add something about uh, the Hungarian case? Uh, Agnes, you want to add something or not? Uh, sorry, we are we are talking on another microphone because of our technical issues. So, okay. but we are the same people. Uh, okay, uh, I can add something. Actually, it was one of the differences that we saw. Not interestingly, not as a difference of what is happening in reality, in terms of Roma people 
typically being pushed to the bottom of the housing hierarchy and discriminated in, in, in many ways against. Uh, but how the issue of discrimination against Roma people and housing poverty uh, connect or don't connect, uh, there is a difference that has to do with how the fields are organized. Um, and it's a bit long and complicated. I wonder if I can really summarize it very shortly, but it would be something like this, that in Hungary, uh, in Budapest, uh, most uh, prominently, social activism, so middle-class expert activism that is about the poor, including the Roma, including the housing poverty, uh, after the regime change, uh, it has a continuity with the social activism of uh, uh, dissidents in the 80s who are liberals. In the 80s, the idea was that you want uh, the end of socialism and free market, and also you want to take care of poor people. And that was one and the same package. Uh, but then, of course, <laughs> there were some contradictions after the <laughs> regime change actually uh, happened. But because of this, uh, tradition, uh, there was this idea that, that Roma poverty, you have to treat as just generic poverty. To, to emphasize too much that it's about the Roma is, uh, is a nationalist thing. You don't do that. It's essentialization. You have to speak of segregates. You have to speak of poverty. Uh, and Later on, uh, when this new left uh, type of organizing uh, got stronger after 2008, also within uh, housing issues, uh, again, we found ourselves in a situation when, when the main formation of the political field is that you have this uh, uh, unquestioned uh, political uh, hegemony of, of the Orban regime, like we are in the fourth two-thirds uh, parliamentary two-thirds uh, governance. And if you organize for social issues, you find yourself in a loose coalition of, of opposition politics that is still dominated by, by liberal voices. Uh, also, during this time, liberals again became quite open to social messaging from the opposition position. They weren't so open when, when they were ruling the country and acting out the, the reforms. Uh, so, so also now, again, uh, somehow this liberal framing of, of, yes, you have to be morally good and redistribute, but on the other hand, we still have to solve everything through the clear power of the market is uh, uh, is quite dominant and it's really hard to distinguish a left housing politics from that and alliances with with the Roma people Roma interest representation or with the problem of uh, uh, Roma uh, related housing issues uh, somehow gets invisibilized by this uh, main uh, very visible very uh, mediatized political contradiction. But maybe, Dorka, do you want to add something? Because you were actually in the process of doing this kind of organizing. Um, yeah, I just uh, thought about that, uh, but now um, Agi said about um, how we could um, permit more um, uh, left use when we focus on, um, um, uh, on the, Mm, so not the, not not on, on the redistribution part, but on the state part, but of, of the how how it uh, could uh, um, work uh, in the capital system, and and my experience is that uh, that by uh, I we work um, with the homeless people and and um, and homeless people uh, always speak about uh, the state and the power and maybe uh, uh, the Fidesz regime, and it is uh, really um, really hard to to explain um, about uh, uh, or, or or to focus uh, on the uh, on the market level because it's uh, or or on the uh, not not on the redistribution part but on the um, 
um, financializations part and 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 this whole uh, global context uh, because it's um, not so um, reachable or it's uh, hard to uh, to to catch uh, or in in the and I think it's also a bit um, uh, because for for us for for uh, for leftist uh, my, uh, middle class people it's um, it's good if if we had this perspective because we could uh, we could understand the the world. Mm, a bit more deeper, but but for people who uh, who are suffering in these conditions, it's it's a it's a mm, yeah, it's more difficult, and uh, I'm struggling with it because, uh, as Zagi said, um, in in our group or in in the cities for all, um, um, it was also it was so the people focused uh, to the distribution part or this. Uh, um, uh, this this power of the state, and for me it was not so um, not so um, not enough maybe <laughs> to say. It. So I I I, I would uh, talk about more more the uh, how it works in the uh, global capitalism and how how could we uh, uh, how could we um, um, tell it to to um, to frame, how could you frame it in, in the move, uh, movement level? But for me, it's a question uh, if we're working with with uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, people from the poverty, how we could frame it because it's a more uh, um, intellectual level or, or how could I say? So maybe it's also a question for to, to you how um, what do you think about this? Can I add something to this? Because uh, I find it very interesting because in, in the Romanian case, um, in the 90s and until the early 2000s, there was a commission uh, doing research and policy proposals against poverty. It had this, um, uh, it was this larger umbrella and it was changed. Uh, to have a focus only on uh, Roma, uh, the problems that uh, persons of Roma ethnicity face. So it was a way of racializing uh, economic problems. And it is consistent with this uh, idea of blurring the fact that the main problem is commodification of housing and the uh, public services and everything and a process that makes uh, working class poorer and um, pushes more and more people into poverty. And it was a way of focusing, as uh, uh, Agnes explained, to this uh, bottom of the hierarchy uh, of social and economic uh, possibilities. So just focus on those who uh, have a certain ethnicity, just focus on a certain group, so that the wider problem, uh, economic and social problem, is blurred with this. And people find it harder to make alliances in this context. Okay. We need. Yes. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, yes. Uh, ah, Peter. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, Yoxi mentioned before the. Um, this sort of other wave of, of reaction, which is more of a right wing or liberal, as you identified, that is uh, related to to housing. But of course, it's probably a completely different aspect. Um, maybe you can uh, say something about this because I think I know what you mean. But um, but yeah, I would be curious of. Uh, Uh, the heritage protection movement that I mentioned. Um, um, so uh, in the uh, mid 2000s, there was um, a sort of growth of mobilizations, different kinds related to uh, aspects of the social and economic life of the, of the city. Some were influenced, for example, by the alter globalization wave. So you had the sort of uh, mushrooming of, of uh, mobilizations, but it was also linked to this uh, um, waiting for Romania to enter the EU, 
for uh, social and economic conditions to improve. There were uh, material promises for uh, a better life, but also for different uh, groups of the middle classes, let's say educated, but not so rich, to be more part of the decision-making processes as they wanted for many decades. <laughs> and um, in this process, you saw different mobilizations uh, forming. And one of them was to protect uh, buildings of heritage value from developers, because at the same time, you had new developers, uh, new developments, real estate developments in the big cities of Romania, and especially Bucharest at that time. And these uh, de new developments were mushrooming as well. Um, and uh, in the, in the mid 2000s, there was an attempt to build an alliance that was called the Pact for Bucharest, the platform for Bucharest that wrote together the Pact for Bucharest that included social housing as well as heritage protection. But after the crisis, uh, the voices that dominate, that started to dominate this heritage protection uh, mobilization of movement or movement were at the same time uh, nationalistic, so protecting the national heritage and the national pride and things like that, and at the same time looking towards the West as an example. We are European, we are civilized, this, this heritage uh, brings civilization and yeah, it's an economic value for the city that connects us to the West, where the uh, investors are from. So, and this is how this uh, um, uh, movement went on. And uh, it's interesting that you ask about it because it also connects to a political party that grew in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis later on, um, that is called Save Romania Union. And it is a right neoliberal uh, party. And it was, uh, its formation was supported by this um, mobilizations in the uh, mid 2000s. So yeah, it, it, it's interesting to see how movements come together and break apart and what grows out of them in, in a different context and as the crisis and as the uh, global, uh, uh, events uh, come upon the local context. Okay, uh, just to, to, to be sure that I understood well. Uh, so this kind of collaboration between, between conservative and uh, more radical movements uh, are spontaneous and are in the time they are limited. I mean, uh, is there, but, but there is a long-term impact on these uh, collaborations, I imagine. And uh, is it beneficial on the long-term? That's, that's my, I, I'm not sure to get the benefits of this collaboration on the long-term. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And also there's a question of Sarah. Maybe if it's in the same field, you can add your question now. Hi, uh, my question actually is a bit different. I wanted to ask that, you know, if you recognize the commodification of housing as the main concern and the central issue, you talked about how there was a period where, you know, uh, housing was kept out of the market, that there was a bargain between the state and the union, unions, or the state, State as an expression of unions where housing. So if you could talk a bit about that history, I would, I would appreciate it. So maybe Agi can go first about uh, with Sarah's question and then I can uh, answer to Eva's question. Should we do like that? Yes, yes, so this one, uh the state power that is based on the social power of unions and they are able to keep some parts of reproductive assets out of the market. Uh, this was about the, the Nordic social democracy model that this Ashbjörn Wall, Wall is uh, writing about. In our case, it was the socialist state which was uh, 
hierarchical developmental state uh, that that was doing urbanization in order, order to serve industrialization and uh, it was always struggling with the uh, uh, a lack of enough resources to put into housing. So even though there were these huge social housing districts uh, built that we know as this main landscape of socialist cities, there was always a problem. It even has its own name, this socialist under urbanization. <laughs> the industrial part is going faster and the housing cannot catch up with it. Uh, and then this was privatized. Uh, after 89. So that's how we got to the uh, current uh, commodified situation. But uh, uh, what we, maybe we didn't mention, or I should have mentioned, it was the more uh, constructive part of it. Uh, so, so why this whole analysis is maybe useful is not to describe even more boldly uh, how much everything is uh, fucked up, right? Uh, uh, by saying that it's not only these two branches or the problem that there is not enough redistribution, the problem is behind that is the base problem of commodification. Uh, so this is just the analysis. But why this is useful, I think, is that uh, it shows to us when we try to organize around housing that um, taking a housing, existing housing problem and taking it to the next immediate existing political uh, interface that we can show it to and claim something from it uh, might be useful in the very short term, but even on the mid term, it doesn't help us build something that even touches upon the base problem of the of, of commodification because it splits the energies between this redistribution issue and the home ownership uh, issue and. Uh, what we were trying to gather with uh, Yokes uh, as examples at the end uh, of the research uh, were, were also examples that, that tried to somehow bridge uh, these problems. Uh, like maybe uh, Yokes will want to speak about the, the union example and uh, where we are mostly active the with the people that I work most closely with uh, here in Budapest is also about um, trying to collaborate both with uh, state actors, if possible, and uh, uh, unions and uh, uh, housing activists to somehow construct structures that are able to take housing out of the market and keep it there. Mm. But uh, in terms of you know, just the perspective, what this gives us, or what it gave us was, was to look at uh, what is the capacity of the movement to create its own direction, its own type of uh, framing. Uh, when the policy institutions that you can speak to uh, accept these type of frames like citizenship, uh, social uh, uh, problems, rights, redistribution, uh, then on the short term you are pressed to speak these uh, uh, languages uh, because you want solutions very fast because the people need it, of course. Uh, but if you think where the movement wants to go through, uh, this is what we understood that we need to build the type of strong movement institutions that are able to ask their own questions and set their own uh, aims independently from the policy uh, interfaces that are given to us. It is that it is only this way, you know, that we can force this uh, issue of commodification uh, to the front as a, you know, as a political perspective. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and to Eva's question um, about the benefits of building these uh, alliances that have a, a short period of time or that are hard to uh, hard to hard to stand a certain situation of a situations of crisis. Mm. I'm thinking now that in moments of evictions, sometimes big evictions, groups that were part of the heritage protection movement in Bucharest, they uh, gave help to uh, in the situation of eviction. So 
in that certain situation, making it visible, taking it outside uh, a small circle of acquaintances and uh, families fighting against the eviction, it was helpful. And it was, it is helpful to bring this uh, issue on, uh, on the public agenda. On the other hand, uh, if, we, if we think about uh, what, where we want to put our efforts into, we, we probably should put our efforts into what Agi said, building these infrastructures that can talk about um, the things that we really want to talk about. So as, uh, as in this case, where we started with the Block for Housing, that is a national uh, platform in Romania where uh, George's um, group is also part of and uh, Fece Dele is also part of and from our colleagues in Timisoara and our colleagues from Eromnia as well. So, and um, Roma Just as well. So different uh, groups coming together in this national uh, platform and uh, starting to talk about housing costs as well. So about wage struggles, reaching out to labor unions about this. And at the same time, labor unions uh, starting to talk about um, housing, uh, housing, but in terms of costs for living costs. And when they fight for uh, higher wages, they say we fight for higher wages because we need to cover living costs and housing is the main cost among these. So this is, we want to put our efforts into something like that. And, but around this, of course, we build as many alliances as we can and we try, and it's usually a, always a trial and error and then trying again and yeah. We, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's a, a good answer, Eva. Now we are laughing here with Jan because uh, because here in Athens, where we are actually, uh, we don't consider that alliances are a good thing <laughs> between uh, conservatives and uh, and us. Uh, so uh, you know, it's also a bit uh, about maybe culture also and uh, and about also this conflict between the right and left wing uh, traditions uh, that uh, are also integrate uh, the, uh, the whole of society from the political institutions to the to the movements um, but anyway uh, this was only a phrase and uh, we had uh, John yes with the question yeah, it's probably just uh, hello everybody. I'm John. I'm living in Ireland in, in Dublin, and I'm part of the coalition through a group called Housing Action Now. Um, and uh, maybe just to start with the research piece, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate how important and valuable work like this is as the raw material that people, that groups and activists need to be able to say, we've got really good analysis uh, and to be able to use that in struggles. I think part of the difficulty sometimes can be how that gets presented. But I think uh, so well done, Joanna and Agnes and Kirsten for doing the work. It's brilliant. I haven't read the book yet, but I hope to read it soon. Um, so well done. Um, the thing that strikes me is this Hegelian distinction between the universal and the particular. And um, so in the coalition, we all know lots of particular stories from around Europe, whether it's Warsaw, Cluj, uh, Paris, uh, Cyprus. Uh, there's, there are so many particular variations, but there is, there is a common thread a lot of the time, um, there may be different actors, um, but with, like in here in Ireland, we've got probably some of the highest rents in the world, right? And we're not a very spectacularly, uh, you know, luxurious place or anything, but it's just pure investment driven capitalism in housing. Um, so what's happened very simply is that all of the public sector field has been 
colonized, co-opted, taken over and pushed into private rental housing effectively. And more and more of the bigger players, the real estate investment trusts are coming to get a, a, a yield, as they call it, or a return on their investment here. So um, the, the problem, like last week here, we have a president who fulfills a symbolic role, uh, but he's very articulate. He's a man in his late 70s. And he said we had moved from a crisis to a disaster. And he really embarrassed the uh, incumbent government in Ireland. Uh, and I think they have now, the situation here is, it's very clear, like nobody in Ireland for a moment these days does not understand that there's a housing catastrophe, right? The, the difficulty is they the, that the spin and the way the story is being told is still consistent ideologically, for instance, that it's just something that's happening and we will get a control of it and so on. But there has been no significant policy shift, just like the story that Joanna and Anya are, are telling, whether it's you know from those places or Berlin or whatever. So um yeah, and I, I think the, the connection, uh, I'm quite interested in the, the alliances questions and um, there's a woman, Ashling, who is part of the coalition here and they've, we've, they've set up the Community Action Tenants Union, which is a national organisation in Ireland, um, to try and build a tenants base. Um, some of the time it's quite difficult, uh, you know, like what's where is the kind of line between authentic working class movements and lower middle class, sometimes it's difficult to tell because of so many people here now are wrapped in that uh, housing crisis problem. Um, because it's just like a lot of people are emigrating. It's just that's they don't have any options. They may find when they emigrate, they have the same problems elsewhere, <laughs> but we'll see. So yeah, I just want to say congratulations. Well done on the book. Um, and well done to Ava and Jan for setting up this evening and other people who've worked on it. So, yeah, brilliant. Great piece of work. And la lucha continua. So, yeah, excellent. Okay. Um, Tobias, you... Yes. Um, I continue. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, I... Partly read the book specifically focusing about the parts in Romania. And for me, what was a very striking question was specifically the the anti-communist air and the anti-communist like um, general, not even fear, but really like hate of anything that even faintly smells of anything communist or leftist, which is, of course, also utilized a lot politically by a lot of neoliberal regimes portraying themselves as neutral and as non-corrupt and as um, future driven. I just want to generally ask how to how that affects the political landscape for the housing question specifically, if that like makes a change or makes a difference in strategies, if that has to be integrated somehow or if it's like same, same, but different compared to, I don't know, other countries where the right is not as omnipresent or the anti-communism is not as strong? Just to, to, to make a note that uh, these uh, intellectual groups that use this language strongly of anti-communism, anti they are very visible, but they are not super large. And uh, it's it's not present in the study, but it's something interesting that I I I want to mention, and I I, I like to mention it when I can. That uh, since the 90s, there have been um, opinion polls in Romania every few years, asking people about how they uh, how they feel about the past, how they feel about the past regime, about different aspects of it, and. Um, if they were hurt before 89, if they think it was better or worse and things like that. And the intellectual groups were always uh, enraged that uh, the majority of the population didn't uh, harshly judge the regime before 89. So this uh, strata that uses strongly this anti-communist discourse and um, arguments and uh, 
denies anything social using this language, it's not so huge, but it's uh, powerful and it has uh, access to resources and to the media. And, and this happens also because it is in line with the rest. So it goes well with Romania's role in the, in the global economy after all. So it has to be a region that uh, uh, gives cheap labor. And in order to have cheap labor, you need to have uh, little protection for workers. So in order to have that, you, you need a discourse that delegitimizes anything that could protect them. So uh, yeah, so it, it's important to show that it, it's connected to something wider as well. It's not just a local uh, thing that's going on. It, it's connected and it's useful for um, capital to advance in, in a country like Romania. And uh, uh, of, of course, this, this affects um, also how, how housing is perceived and how um, maybe to, to give um, an insight from the ground that it has been hard for people to acknowledge that housing is a right and it's not just a private issue to be solved privately. But this is slowly happening. So I, I don't know if I answered exactly the question, but yeah. Thank you, yes. Okay. Can I? Bravo. Yes. I am Antonio from Lisbon, Portugal, so from the far west. And I want to thank you because uh, in fact from Abita, Abita is uh, a collective in association struggling for the right to housing and to the city as well here uh, in Lisbon. And um, I really want to thank you because I started, I'm also a PhD student on housing struggles in Lisbon and I really found, found your book in really, really interested, interesting, both from academic point of view and of course uh, activist part point of view uh, this idea of going of using the, the structural fields of contention approach create this approach is uh, something that can be useful for my research in the future so thank you very much and um, at the same time uh, yes going knowing a little bit about the history of you say housing crisis is not something new it's something that already exists uh, is something that uh, I feel that here we need to to understand, to go and to to study because there is a general perception in Portugal of Portuguese as people that don't fight, don't struggle, so biologically uh, enable, unable to to struggle, and it's something very very commune, very diffuse even among activists in somehow. So, and then when you go back and you see the history of the revolution, the so-called revolution in the 70s, and especially the, the years later, you find many many experiences that were important for giving house to many people and to create also a different world. Uh, world, uh, a different way of living. At the same time, it's also important to understand that it's something that I'm Italian and I, so I need to, I took some time to understand here in Portugal that uh, F, uh, in IMF policies or bailouts are not something from 2012. It already happened in uh, 81 and 78 and uh, put the end. So it's history is very important. It's, it can be banal, but it's very important to understand ourselves, to understand also our failures. Uh, and the, so, yes, and you give a very, very grounded frame to, to read this, uh, this history. So, um, so in, in the idea of creating an imaginary, imaginary in the future is also important to uh, to, to, to create an imaginary of the past here, at, at least in Portugal. And uh, then, of course, I find many similarities uh, on the problems and the housing crisis, uh, many questions uh, we, can, we can do, like why we don't we have a, a tenants movement? Uh, and we see that uh, home ownership ideology is very structured, it's something very diffuse here. And now it's something that is changing in somehow because the new uh, generation of uh, low or middle class are not able to access credit because the state does, does, don't 
support as supported before. Uh, in the 90s, uh, they arrived to, to spend 75% of um, public expenditure on housing. The, the Portuguese state, 75% uh, of the expenditure of housing was to, uh, how to say, um, to the banks, to pay the credits to of the people. So it's something that um, uh, it's not happening now. So this crisis is touching uh, these new uh, people like uh, more educated than the generations before. This is also another similarity that impressed me when I arrived and I discovered this in Italian, seeing the literacy rate uh, by, by of Portugal, uh, where, well, it's something uh, that it, it has to be taken into consideration when we talk also on the mobilization, mobilization on, we try to understand why people are not doing something that we expect they do. Um, and uh, yes, and also this role of the middle class experts that's in, com in some somehow uh, here we have uh, in, in this moment, I feel that we as middle class uh, experts or not experts, not always, but middle class, we're trying to uh, politicize uh, housing issues related in what you call it uh, housing poverty. And at the same time, without under, without uh, without mm, reaching a lot of results, so uh, I share with you this idea of uh, creating different infrastructures of movements, whatever it can be. And, uh, here now, the solution are seems that there there is a new uh, wave of cooper cooperatives. Um, Cooperatives, can you say? Yes, I think so. Uh, cooperative movements, the young people, these middle class experts or not experts, activists in many cases, are trying to, to give, uh, to, to find solutions in cooperativism. I'm not sure that this is a solution or something that can, uh, can go beyond uh, this duality you, you also registered. And uh, thank you. That's it. it. Was more a commentary. I also interested. I didn't read uh, all the book. I just read uh, the, the first part. But you talk a lot about political silences, and uh, it's probably something interesting to, to to understand. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Antonio. I I um, I. Uh, just to connect to what you said with what Tobias uh, talked about, so uh, this this uh, um, mainstream discourse that say that people are unable to struggle, that they don't struggle, that they are passive and things like that, and and uh, with Agi we have talked a lot about this that actually the labor movement was quite big in Romania and powerful, but it was slowly uh, cut down, and when people talk about civil society in Eastern Europe and things like that, they don't talk about this huge labor movement that was organizing enormous protests in the 90s and things like that. So it's also what, what research and discourse and a mainstream is looking at because it, the, 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 the society is not passive, but it depends where you look at to see action and mobilization. But yeah, Agi, maybe you want to talk about silences more. Well, just to give another example, uh, when we spoke of silences, in general, we meant that the, <laughs> the area where that tension is present is bigger than, than the groups that, that are involved in voicing it. Uh, which is you know, quite generic to all the problems, but it doesn't mean that those people are not doing anything. Uh, most of the cases, it means that they are completely caught up in, in the struggle to solve it materially, which is this super innovative, uh, collective, uh, everyday uh, struggle. So one example would be uh, what we called the urban peripheralization of uh, housing poverty in Budapest. I, I wrote about uh, also based on the research of another colleague, Andras Vigvari, um, of these uh, past allotment gardens that in the 90s became this 
place where people started to set up uh, semi-legal dwellings. And with each wave of housing peripheralization, because of privatization then, because of the uh, mortgage uh, uh, crisis of the late 2000s, then because of this uh, boom of housing prices of the second half of the 2010s, then people go there and do this. And there, their interest is that you know, it's not like they are going to stage a protest in face of the local government as they go there, because their interest is that the local government doesn't even know that they are there or, you know, uh, but uh, this doesn't mean that it, it's not a real struggle. It's a very uh, intense everyday activity of where they also know it very well, why they have to be there, why they have to soak the warm water in, in such a tricky way, why they have to use, uh, use the secondhand uh, building materials in order to still be able to access the, the, the job market of the city, of the same city that <laughs> is not able to provide them uh, uh, housing. And the, even uh, this is also, uh, phenomenon that is described elsewhere that many of the public workers like bus drivers who ensure that the city is working or many of the construction workers who are building the new shiny faces of the financial city are the ones who live here and create their livelihood like this. Um, okay, uh, another same, you know, this hidden abode of material struggles is uh, present in the debtors cases, because just in order to, to, to do any kind of uh, struggle, not even on the political level, but to file a legal case in your own individual interest uh, is already so much effort that most of these households cannot provide. Why? Because most of their work goes into trying to survive despite the huge debt burden. Um, so, when none of the, this kind of visible or institutional struggle happens, then most of the struggle happens on the household and inter-household levels where they, uh, you know, still have somehow innovate themselves uh, through this period when they pay more out of their incomes than, uh, than they would be able to. Mm. And uh, there's just another thing that stuck in my mind uh, when Eva was uh, speaking about this coalition between uh, right wing and uh, and and left wing movements. What we think about this? Uh, I don't think we say that they need to, to form a coalition, and that's a good thing. Uh, we were just looking at uh, when this happens or doesn't happen. Uh, there was this issue with the heritage movement in in Bucharest, and in Budapest, the typical case is the debtors movement. Uh, you know people who have to pay like 80% higher installments to banks just because the uh, currency exchange rates uh, changed and they have to uh, uh, give up their houses and even then they remain with the, uh, uh, with the dragging on that because uh, of the type of contracts that they signed and so on. Um, and <laughs> the way this got politicized was through these right-wing frameworks of Hungarian people being robbed by Western banks uh, and, uh, and even the Orban's campaign in the 2010 elections was very much pushing this framework. Um, but then uh, many of these people, they didn't help. Typically the debtors who were deeper in trouble didn't get helped. Uh, for, for those in the most of the trouble, there was a special uh, social solution, but this lower half of the debtors uh, continued to have problems, but then their struggles got already silenced because after 2014, 15, the official narrative was that this has been solved and uh, it's a non-issue from now on. And those debts, they were outsourced from banks to these debt collector companies. So it wasn't even a bank for portfolio problem anymore. Uh, so these people, you know, when they were still trying to <laughs> express their problem, but they were completely muted. Uh, you might ask why there was no connection with the, with the other movements, like for instance, the, the movements around the anti-homeless legislation that the same uh, government enacted at the same time. 
uh, and actually they were efforts from both sides. So these debtors, they invited uh, right to the, uh, the city of, <laughs> the city's plural activists to their meetings. And they also tried to go to the city uh, is for all uh, uh, demonstrations, but, uh, but it somehow didn't work. And beyond ideological problems like, uh, I don't know, anti-Semitism or, uh, or something, the, uh, the other big problem <laughs> that didn't allow the coalition was that they actually didn't think that, it's, that the problem is the same. The debtor said that homelessness is not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I spoke to the city uh, is for all activists who said that we went to their meetings, but then we saw that their struggle is not about us. They don't think we are important. And, uh, uh, you know, for these people to, to get back their own uh, houses, it's also not our own problem. Uh, so this is, you know, very factual how this... Uh, Duality of the of the housing problem really rips the even the struggles apart. Yes, uh, I, th so thank you for uh, reacting to that also. Um, and uh, yeah, I noticed uh, a lot of times um, some. Um, conflicts arising from uh, two different perspectives on one same struggle. Uh, but also, uh, I want to say an example from uh, what's happening in Brussels at the moment, uh, because I, I live in Athens, but I, I was uh, many years in housing struggles in, in Brussels. So um, there is a, a conflict between two uh, groups that both are anti-capitalistic and more uh, left uh, wing, uh, let's say, uh, uh, in their perspective. One of them uh, is fighting for social housing and the other one is fighting for uh, having green areas in the city. And now uh, they are willing to build the social housing on a collective uh, garden in a neighborhood. So uh, the persons from the collective garden try to reach out the groups from the so, who support social housing, telling them they should make a coalition somehow that's okay for social housing, but not, not there. And the housing, uh, social housing uh, groups said, uh, no, we want social housing there uh, because it's like a middle class uh, collective garden, so we want, uh, and we need social housing uh, desperately. Uh, so, I mean, uh, also this, we, are, we were talking about collaboration between uh, two different groups that come from two different political, uh, ideological backgrounds, but there is also conflicts from groups that come from the same ideological background, but uh, have different uh, uh, perspective on, on one specific land or one specific project. So I don't know if you, if you, if you have somehow some some similar examples uh, that you can share, or or maybe anyone else uh, who is in this discussion, if you want, uh, or maybe pass to another question because we will soon finish, and I don't want to monopolize. Uh, Peter, can, uh, Peter, you can uh, add your question. Yeah, but I have a different question. So if you want to answer to this, maybe, I don't know. Maybe just, I just say what I wanted to say. Um, um, so yeah, um, yeah so I'm, I'm, I'm now uh, in this call from Berlin and um, Berlin, in the, the last five years, we saw a very big mobilization of, of the tenant movement, but that of course has to do with the fact that uh, that here you have 85% of tenants, which is covering basically most of the social spectrum. Um, and and uh, for me, it's very interesting what you're talking about uh, um, when you talk about this middle class, uh, you know, experts or the, the because I, I really believe that what happened in the, the past few years um, in Berlin is that the, the the housing crisis really reached the middle classes and and so the, the this reaction was formulated in a completely different 
way because if anything then berlin is also a good example for the um constant uh, <laughs> uh, constantly existing housing crisis which is which has not been solved any time after the war basically or there was no period when there was no um anyways and um um, but, but this is, of course, uh, um, the, the, I think there is this lucky historical situations, which also when we talk about uh, Spain and La Paz, when the same thing happened, that uh, there was a social problem that reached uh, almost all parts of the like, all classes, and so there could, could have been a movement that that was uh, strong. <clears throat> um, um, so this, I don't know wh what you what you think about this. That there is any chance to what what could be the the, the main aspect of um, mobilization in, in in Eastern Europe that uh, that that would um, yeah that would unite struggles because because I think this is the biggest problem there and and also uh, this is slightly other question because um but what how do you think that um, that um, um smaller cities or towns and and villages are developing and countryside because i feel that the, that most of what you're talking about is compressed in bucharest um budapest and maybe page and cluj but um but we don't have the, the 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 movements as it is in spain for example where you have uh, even in small towns so um, yeah, maybe what is the what is happening outside the cities, and why is it so that it's so compressed? Maybe I will just say something very fast, also to link it with Eva's uh, uh, idea. Uh, so this example with the garden and the social housing being squeezed in the same spot, and then it appears as a as if it would be a movement conflict <laughs> between the people who want the garden and the people who want the social housing. But <laughs> this is exactly what what we mean by by the need to to be able to forge our own institutionalized structure that is strong enough to pose our own questions because. <laughs> uh, then the idea would be that no, 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 we want both gardens and, and social housing. And why it appears as a conflict that it is compressed within the same small plot because of this pressure to use every square meters uh, for profit. And this doesn't solve the issue in the, sh in the very short term because obviously they cannot have both uh, in the same square meters. Uh, but this is the challenge that we see that somehow we need to be able to, to build our movement in such a way that uh, that it can act towards broadening this this reproductive space instead of allowing uh, the existing structures to to create these 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 false groups and dichotomies uh, uh, within the movement. Uh, and then uh, uh, Peter's question is for me it seems like the same question but from the other angle like okay but uh, if there is a housing crisis that is bigger it. Uh, uh, touches upon more and more social groups. How do you forge them together? Uh, we didn't write about this because, of course, we were not in the role of giving out recipes, uh, and also maybe we don't even know. <laughs> but uh, uh, the way I would think of it, also based on this logic, how we uh, were thinking, uh, is that it's not about the, you know getting together and speaking about it or having the same opinions that have to be shared across uh, all the groups or something, but uh, rather about, <laughs> are we able to find some kind of a structural uh, strategy uh, that can link these uh, problems in such a way that they don't get channeled into this uh, systemically uh, predefined conflict with each other. Because if you struggle for the same few little plots, if you struggle for the same small amount of redistribution, uh, you're going to uh, go against each other instead of uh, going against uh, capital. And then uh, I think this is, the, this is the real challenge of how to construct a movement, how, 
how you use uh, the, the different types of institutional embeddedness that we can get. You know, we can get a bit into the local government. Uh, we can use the union struggle, uh, not only to get some benefit for the uh, housing and then we spend it on the market, but rather on to develop union housing that is not on the market anymore. Uh, so how to connect uh, these uh, parts uh, in such a way that, that they are able to uh, enhance each other. And then about the, the, the rural question, uh, in Budapest, for instance, I didn't go uh, further than this peri-urban uh, semi-legal uh, dwellings uh, because unfortunately the research was only about comparing capital cities. But uh, I think it is present in uh, Hungary. It doesn't get politicized. The more you get into the, the smaller localities, the stronger the grip of formal politics uh, uh, is. And, and you know, people just wouldn't go out and demonstrate because their kids have to go to the same schools and they have to have jobs in the same city and they need to get a, a loan from the same bank that is all of it is operated by the same networks. Uh, rather, where one of the areas where we saw this as a more mobile uh, area of tension, where where maybe some organizing could actually reach uh, some effect uh, in the short term, is the uh, labor mobility. There is a labor shortage crisis here that is growing ever since 2015, and. Uh, uh, you know, Hungary has, like Slovakia or, uh, or Serbia, is reorganized as this uh, cheap uh, reindustrialization zone uh, where both Western and Eastern factories are outsourced. Uh, and, and those workers, uh, they have to live somewhere. Uh, the, the, that housing doesn't exist. And then it becomes also a, a way of investment, how to create that housing. Uh, so, so that is one of the areas where, where some of my colleagues have been trying to get into. Maybe to add that the links between rural and urban, they, some, they sometimes come up. For example, when there are evictions and people have to return to rural areas where they are from, or in this very uh, uh, wide practice of informal housing, that in the Romanian case got politicized uh, at some point. So then uh, of course you have the um, uh, uh, migrate, the rural urban migration, and then it's, it's a question of uh, tenants and housing costs in the bigger cities. And you have uh, migration abroad, and this also becomes an issue. So you you can see these links between urban rural between larger smaller cities and um but how to uh, and we tried uh, with the in both our cases there were attempts to organize with people uh, in smaller locations and there still are but it's difficult because you need a constant presence there so uh, for the moment, I think in both our cases, it, it happens at this uh, edge between urban, rural, smaller cities, bigger cities, when events happen. Yeah. So I'm not sure uh, we said maybe to finish, but I would like to ask a last question because um, in the coalition, what we are doing, okay, we are doing a lot of things, but uh, Maybe the most fruitful is our physical meetings. And there we present each other our local struggles. And it's uh, very inspiring, but a lot of times I feel like, okay, obviously we know that the local situations are different in many ways, but then we try to transfer somehow the good experience from, from other collectives to, to our own uh, local situation. But I feel a lot of times we do it in a kind of trial and error approach. And uh, in your study, you, you offered this uh, structural field of contention approach. And I was wondering if you, if you think like uh, we can gain something for the coalition, for the movement in general, uh, to have some landmarks of com comparison that we 
okay, that we somehow lose, uh, get rid of this trial and error and uh, have more productive exchange um, uh, amongst us. Yes, very easy question, Jan. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, but I, I can I can go I can go and say I can answer as a Fetche de Le member first, who uh, a group which is part of the European Action Coalition, and say that for us it was very useful to actually know what's going on in other uh, contexts to understand these wider processes that are going on and that affect us. It's the same processes, but that affects us in different ways. So uh, the EU uh, legislation on economy, the financialization, we, we didn't engage with financialization at all until we talked with uh, uh, friends and colleagues in Hungary and in other places. We said, no, there is no, credits are not a big thing in Romania. Uh, cred not credits are, but uh, mortgages. Mortgages are not a big deal in Romania, so why should we engage in this? But uh, exchanging on this uh, macro level uh, processes that are going on and that affect housing, wages, uh, the economy, this is really, really helpful. And uh, it's not so much the uh, comparison, but understanding how they affect differently, different uh, uh, territories and how they are connected. So that uh, is from. Uh, Agi, maybe you want to add? Yeah, it's hard to add a really good thing to this. Uh, I am not a member of the coalition, uh, but uh, I have spent considerable time on similar meetings, uh, just starting from other issues. And there is always this relatively sad impression that <laughs> we are, <laughs> a bunch of small bottom-up initiatives without resources who in their own territory encounter again and again the same type of problems, but the actors who cause the same type of problems are these super huge, powerful, globally organized, coherent actors like, I don't know, BlackRock uh, and uh, uh, such. Uh, and because of this, you feel like we are the members of this endless iteration of, of small things. And yes, wh whenever I see this picture, I feel that, <laughs> that our, our main challenge is, is that of, of scaling, of trying to somehow create the, the mid-level structure on which uh, we can somehow collectively address, build up our powers in such a way that that is bigger and we can collectively address these, uh, these uh, very uh, uh, coherent uh, powers that are co causing our problems. And it is only one uh, such organization that I know from relatively close, uh, which uh, Rujana Poshwe is here. She's one of the initiators, initiators of it. So uh, it is uh, MOBA, this, uh, Alliance of Housing Cooperative Initiatives uh, from uh, Eastern and Southern Europe. Uh, it started from such a meeting when, when our cooperative initiatives, all of them uh, identified each other as iterations of the same problem that you start, you are small, nobody is giving you a loan, the legal system doesn't, uh, the banking system doesn't uh, acknowledge you because they don't know what the cooperative is and so on. Uh, and then the idea was that to create MOBA as this uh, regional organization that can both make this problem visible to bigger actors, but can also hopefully become this mid-level uh, actor that can, that can then challenge, for instance, a, a, a channel uh, patient capital or, or social capital into these uh, smaller, uh, cooperatives. So yeah, it's just one small example, but uh, I would think towards this direction. Okay, thank you. Uh, you want to say something, Jörg? 
Yeah, yeah, uh, because I, I feel uh, Peter's uh, question about uh, uh, resources for building alliances. So how to build alliances when, uh, you know, when uh, different groups of the middle classes are uh, still supported by the state, but and they are not as much affected by the different crises as um, lower middle, uh, uh, lower income groups. I think this is a, a very important question. And even though we don't have uh, clear answers or the answers are different in different contexts, I think this is also something to look into. I keep looking into. Okay, so thank you, uh, first of all, for presenting your study. And also thank you, uh, Misha, for supporting us uh, technically. Um, it would be nice to have a beer together now. It's not possible, but uh, as Eva already wrote in the chat, uh, we will meet uh, next time in Athens in the beginning of November. And then we can have these discussions and have a beer after. <laughs> And uh, yes, and uh, don't uh, hesitate if you have like ideas for following up discussions to, to write us an email. I think it's very fruitful. And um, again, thank you, uh, Eox and Agnes, and also Kristen, the, uh, who is not here tonight. And and Dorka, who participated uh, also yes. in the study, and we met uh, tonight. Yes. And all the participants with uh, your questions and listening to us. Yes. So, so more questions can be asked to the authors, I think, uh, uh, through email. Uh, we can gather them as uh, facilitators of the coalition and send them to the authors. Maybe it would uh, be also interesting for you. Uh, and uh, yes. Ah, and also it was really great uh, to have the study accessible open source. I wanted to stress this point too. It's uh, really important, I think. And uh, see you soon. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good to see you. Good to see you, yes. <laughs>